It is not too late for the majority to choose a bipartisan path forward to reopen the House. Take yes for an answer. Every day, every day, the majority chooses to engage in a Republican civil war that is threatening their own members instead of engaging with us in the work of the American people is a day that weakens this institution and the standing of our country. We need a speaker who will govern through consensus, not conflict. We need a speaker worthy of wielding that gavel, a leader who will defend democracy, not degrade it. More than ever, we need proven, patriotic, people-first leadership. And that is why I am proud to nominate Hakeem Jeffries as Speaker of the House. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio and powered by our favorite sponsor, TireGit.com. That's TireGit.com. You all have to buy tires from somebody. You might as well buy them from us and help fund the movement, help support the movement. We believe in the freedom of movement, and that's exactly what the establishment wants to take from you now. I am your host, Royce White, here in the belly of the beast, Minneapolis, Minnesota, for episode 117. The day is October 22nd, year of our Lord, 2023. <clears throat> and there you heard it yourself from, this, from the well of the Congress, the call for Hakeem Jeffries to become the speaker in a bipartisan way forward. Uniparty, uniparty, uniparty. You got to say it three times like Beetlejuice. This is exactly, this is exactly what happened in Nazi Germany. This is America's Nazi moment. I want people to understand. And I want you to hear that and understand that it's not going to be some, you know, some, some incredible public speaker who's ferocious and, and, and uh, you know, uh, aggressive and, and, and passionate, although psychotic and, and, and evil in their oratory. It's going to be somebody like a Hakeem Jeffries who kind of just stands up and lets the rest of the commu communist, communist, Marxist, leftist, neocon, neoliberal, globalist cohort, you know, sneak him in to a position of power. And, you know, th this, is a, this is our Nazi moment. Well, we got to understand that. And I know it couldn't come at a more inopportune time. Then right now, we're on our way to war. It's Nazi Germany, uh, the Third Reich, it, it rose after a war, but, but they weren't necessarily in the middle of, of a war when, when Hitler came to power. Hitler rose to power, and then he went to war, or, or he started a war. Um, we're in the middle of a war, and in fact, we're in the middle of, of a few wars right now. Uh, one, we're in an economic trade war with China. We are in a biological war with China and some other countries as well. We're at war with Russia. Now we're at war there in the Middle East with the entire Muslim and Arab world. And despite my, my predictions in the, over the last couple of weeks that the Arab and Muslim world isn't as together as we would, that, that isn't to get as together as some would have us believe, um, we found that to be still up in the air. I mean, the, the, the verdict's not yet in on that. I think when push comes to shove, 
uh, many in the Muslim and Arab world, especially from the the monarchies and the and the leadership there, from a nation standpoint, will will kowtow and bend a knee to the status quo. Um, the people on the ground, the the Muslims and Arabs that 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 are common everyday Muslims and Arabs in that in that part of the world may feel differently. And like I said before, the monarchies and and the and the leaders there all throughout the Arab world always have to be conscious, always have to be cognizant of the spirit of the, the will of their people, because unlike here in America, uh, uprisings and revolts in the Middle East or in the Arab world have toppled governments, sometimes with our help. So we're at war on three fronts. We're at war with China, we're at war there in Russia, and we're now at war there in the Middle East and, and in the Arab world. And I hear Vladimir Putin saying, hey, we're going to bring ships, we're going we're gonna to start to do patrol uh, in, in the Black Sea, and the Jordanians and, and the Egyptians are playing hardball, the Jordanians, the, the, the Syrians, and, and the other surrounding nation states there in the Middle East are not, are not uh, rolling over. Uh, should we say, um, for this this pro-Israel, pro-West, pro-NATO narrative. Um, and the PR is, is incredibly bad for us right now. It's, an, it's incredibly bad. Um, the, the Palestinians are being bombed. They're, they're still bombing, bombing in Gaza, um, airstrikes in Gaza. And, and the, more, the more and more bombs fall in Gaza, the more you will see the, the Palestinian people rally others to their cause around the world, other Arabs, other Muslims, but also other Western intellectual elites, political elites, so on and so forth. And Palestine has, it has the potential to become the next hijacked call beacon for solidarity and unity, as they said right there in the will of the Congress here in the West. And it's not that I don't see I don't, I don't have sympathy for the Palestinians. It's not that I agree with what Israel is doing. In fact, I said a couple of weeks back, you can, or about a week back, you can watch the episode where I, I asked the question very frankly, what do we do from here? And to pretend like we don't have to be cognizant of the narrative or, or, or the propaganda or the spirit of the times or, or the way that the, the, the PR looks in this issue is foolhardy. It's foolhardy. It's naive. It's arrogant. Um, it is... Um, a sign of weak leadership. We have to be cognizant of the narrative. We have to be cognizant of the way things look. And, and right now, and for many years, per the shrinking of, of Palestine, per the shrinking of the original two-state agreement between the United Nations, Palestinians, and, 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 and Israel, um, just from the shrinking alone, the narrative is already not on the side of Israel. The narrative is perceived as the Israelis have have slowly but surely restricted the Palestinians into smaller space, which is true. Now, the flip side of that argument, and I always want to give both sides of the argument, because I don't need to take a side. I live here in America. I'm an American citizen. What I'm worried about first and foremost is the well-being and prosperity of Americans. Now, we find ourselves in a more globalized society, a more globalized economy, a more globalized culture, so so be it. We have to deal with where we are on the field. We have to deal with where we are on the battlefield as we are right now today. Because to, to pretend or to just wake up tomorrow and act as though we aren't where we are would also be naive, foolhardy, arrogant, stupid, would lead to more mistakes, would lead to failures and loss. Um, so we are where we are. And our interest is, is deeply tied up in Israel. Um, our interest is deeply tied there in the Middle East. And, and, you know, this is, this is the Holy Land for a reason. This is the center of the world for a reason. The many, many of nations' interests in a globalized society, in a globalized economy, in a globalized culture, uh, you know, come to, a, come to a head right there in that region. And that's why you're seeing all these nations getting ready to throw down. And, and like I said, the, the Arab world is not going as quietly as some would, would have presumed. I mean, we all are kind of telling ourselves this story, myself included, um, that the Arabs, the more, the more posh, the more prosperous, wealthy, um, Western, uh, westernized elites in, in, the, in the Arab world will eventually kowtow and bend the knee to, to, mod, to modernity, to, to progress, to, to economic interest, to 
being a part of the next chapter of, of human evolution and human society, which you can look at in, in Saudi Arabia, or you can look at in the UAE or, or you know, in, in Qatar and, and so on and so forth. Um, they're all in for the fourth industrial revolution. They're all in for the technological revolution. They're all in for, for automation, robotics, artificial intelligence, and, 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 and so on and so forth. But the Qataris have never renounced their involvement with radical Islam or, or to provide finance or cover or, or political capital for terrorist cells. I mean, this is per our own intelligence community. This is per people very high up in the intelligence community that say within the Qatari government, there are people who are sympathetic to the, to the, the cause of the Muslim Brotherhood or to radical Islam and so on and so forth. So, you know, there are the same thing with the Jordanians, you know, they got a king there in Jordan who's, who's his own kind of guy. You know, he, he wants to play ball when it's advantageous for him and, and, and staying in a position of power. But when it's not, when it's a danger or threat for him to side with the West, he will side with the Arab and Muslim world. So everybody's kind of in a Mexican standoff, for lack of a better phrase. And we're going to see. I mean, now we're in the fog of war. Like the great Steve Bannon always says, once you cross over into the fog of war, you're, you are now in the law of uncertain outcomes. And the outcome here is, is very uncertain. It's very uncertain for us here in the West. It's very uncertain for the people there in Israel or Palestine. It's very uncertain for everybody all across the world. We have effectively begun World War III. It started. It's on. And there's been a few other times where where World War where we were on the brink of World War Three, right? Vietnam, the Cold War, the first war in the Middle East, the second war in the Middle East, all of them that carried the potential to trigger a world war. And you can look at each one of those situations and and the the failure to launch, so to speak of not triggering World War III um, as, a, as a sort of a segue to a segue to the potential for World War III to be increased. You know, with each conflict we come to, with each, with each, cross, with each crossroads we come to as a global society and we avert World War III, the next conflict tends to bring more potential for World War III, and we're seeing that right now. And, and you can hear it in the rhetoric, right? You can hear it in the rhetoric. People are saying all across the world, you know, free the Palestinians. It's been 50, 60 years. They're referencing the, the history. They're referencing the, the history of the dynamic of power. They're referencing the history, or at least the perceived history, of the, West, the West's colonial uh, dominance on the world stage. And this is where if we're not aware, we're not conscious, we're not cognizant of the narrative and, and of the, the perception, um, we could be dealt a, a, a great blow. So it's one of the most inopportune times to have a, a Nazi moment here in our own country. But that's exactly what we have here in our own country. And I'm going to play another video for you now. Um, this video was it's time to um, end the my apologies. This video was uh, the first video was the call for Hakeem Jeffries to become the next House Speaker if the Republicans cannot end our, our internal conflicts. The Republican Party cannot end our internal conflicts, our, our civil war, as she called it. Um, and now, now. Hakeem Jeffries even goes so far as to say uh, on MSNBC, we need to change the rules. We need to change the rules to strip away the power from the minority to hold up the, the, the business, the, the, the will, the, the, the will of the, of the body, of the congressional body, of the majority. And I continue, I continue to harp about how important race is right now today in this cultural narrative, in this time in, in American politics, in this time in global politics, and the narrative of race, the narrative of skin color, the, 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 great, the great downfall of the Darwinian worldview, 
of the Darwinian academic tradition, intellectual tradition, is going to be the perception of race being wielded, being hijacked to keep people divided so that we can stay conquered, so we can stay in a position of, of chaos that doesn't allow us to fight back against the real corrupt status quo. And I'm not talking about the chaos that the Democrats are now using as propaganda to call foul on the Republican House members. I'm not talking about that kind of chaos. Because to me, that's not chaos. That's, that's, to me, that's a, a necessary disagreement that needs to happen about fundamental first principles, about core beliefs, about values, about the direction of the country. No different than when the country was founded. There was disagreement. There was discord. There was, there was what people could perceive or call chaos when our, when our founding documents were written. The real chaos that's just over the horizon, the real, and I won't even say just over the horizon, the real chaos that has now made it to our doorstep as American citizens is the chaos that is being promoted, that is being advocated by Democrat House members in saying that we should come together as the majority in the House, bipartisan, to change the rules, to make it so any minority can't, can't get in the way of business as usual, can't stifle the business of, of the corrupt status quo. And they're going to use the war to do it. They're going to use the war in the Middle East as a pretext to, to make a speedy decision, to make a speedy decision to, to move past partisan politics and change the rules, change the rules of the Congress, change the fundamental tenets of democracy, take away the rights of the minority. They're going to use the Palestinians. They're going to use the Ukrainians. They're going to use the Russians. They're going to use the Israelis. They're going to use whoever they need to to execute their agenda. And, and, and I've said it, and we continue to say it here on the right. We continue to say it here in the conservative movement, the Alex Joneses of the world, the Steve Bannons of the world. Many, many people continue to caution that the conflict, that the, the chaos, that the divide and conquer strategy will eventually end up on your doorstep, and they're doing it right now, and they have the best cover story they have one of the best cover stories you could possibly hope for as, a, as an elite, as a political elite trying to pre preserve a corrupt status quo. War, war, chaos, carnage, death, tragedy, children dying, children dying underneath the rubble of airstrikes and bombs. Great cover, great cover for a Nazi moment here in America. And that's exactly what we have. This right now is our Nazi moment. And the worst, the worst part about it, the worst part about it is there may not be anything we can do about it right now. If the House is, if, if, if the last two weeks in the House, if the last two weeks in the United States Congress has proven anything, it's that there is an overwhelming majority that are in support of a corrupt status quo. There is an overwhelming majority that is in support of business as usual there in D.C. They're only arguing or fighting about the split. They're only arguing or fighting about who's going to have both hands on the steering wheel of power. They're not arguing about whether or not the status quo should continue. They're just arguing about who should be the front man, who should, be, who should get the bigger piece of the pie. And that's a dangerous, dangerous place for the American citizens to be in. That's a dangerous place for our nation to be in. And if you hear, I mean, just look at these people. Look at these people. Look at what leadership has become in our country. And you guys can look at me and say, ah, you know, he's got a potty mouth. He's got a harsh mouth. He swears too much or whatever the case may be. Look at these fucking assholes that we, the people, elected to represent the interests of we the people, of America, of this nation, of the American citizen, of citizenship. Look at these fucking assholes we all elected. Respectfully, respectfully. I know you may not want to hear it, but this is the God's honest truth. We may be in a position right now where the Nazi moment in America has no pushback, 
Sure, Matt Gates and the other six people who fought back against the corrupt status quo may stand up in the well of the Congress as these proceedings take place and object. But fundamentally, systematically, from a, from a, from a Democratic standpoint, if the majority of House Republicans want to reach across the aisle and shake hands with the Democrats right now to silence and suppress Matt Gates and any other dissenters there in the Congress, they're going to have the numbers to do so. And let's pray to God that there's a, a massive awakening in the Republican Party, that the Matt Gates of the world and, and anybody else that, that really believes in freedom and citizenship and a true democratic process, not a crony, a crony democratic process, not a corrupt democratic process, anybody who believes in a real democratic process will have the ability, have the courage, have the effectiveness to go to the other House Republican members and, and make sure that what Hakeem Jeffries and the Democrats are suggesting doesn't, doesn't happen. Now, you can all look at Matt Gates and say, hey, you just used these people a couple weeks ago to get McCarthy out. We're in the fog of war. We're at war. We have to use what we have when we have it. And sometimes you have to wake people up. Sometimes even on your own team, you have to wake people up. You have to shake them, shake them up a little bit. And I was fine that the, that the Democrats, because if the Democrats hadn't done that, they have a constituency that they have to stay uh, save face for. The pendulum swings both ways. But I think overall right now, everybody can see, everybody can see that the real, the real play for the uniparty is to get the House Republicans to show their uniparty ways. The House Republicans to abandon and betray the American people, the American citizens, the conservative movement, betray the conservative movement in the interest of another forever war, which is what we're going to there in the Middle East, another forever war, and, and, and strip the ability of the minority to stifle the business of Congress, the business of the uniparty, the business of a corrupt status quo, business as usual. And when we say strip the minority, isn't it interesting that we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion? These are hallmarks. These are calling cards of the, the liberal left and the, and the entire progressive American culture, the entire progressive American political culture. This is, the, this is the catchphrase. This is the buzzword. This is the way to pretend to be woke, to pretend to care about black people and other minority groups that are, that are victims of history. Minority, minority, minority. And who are they looking to elect as Speaker of the House? And all y'all want to say, we don't need to talk about race. Let's stop talking about race. It doesn't matter. Let's not make it a race thing. Our Nazi moment, in a, and this is exactly how Satan would play. This is exactly how a corrupt, a corrupt political elite would play. They're going to use your momentum against you. It's brilliant. It's genius. This is, this is the martial way. You use your opponent's energy against you. Your opponent, the opponent there in D.C. isn't the Republicans and Democrats. The opponent is you at home. The opponent is you, the willful participant in a nation and in a nation's political process that is all but docile and, and, and apathetic. You're the opponent. And the very few who stand up there in D.C. and try to speak on your behalf who can't even get the support they need when it comes time to a two-year primary or a two-year or a four-year primary, they can't even, we can't even get the support we need in the America First movement to primary rhino conservatives. These people are about to hand over the government in a true Nazi moment, and they're going to use the Jews to do it, and they're going to use black people to do it. Isn't that ironic? We got to go to war to, to protect Israel. We're going to send $100 billion to the Israelis so they can defend themselves, but we're also going to send $100 million to the Palestinians so they can, what, pick themselves up off the pavement? Well, why are we sending any money to either? I mean, if we're going to fund both sides, why are we even sending any, why send any money at all? Why are we sending any money at all? Because we are 
we are married to, we are committed to, our formerly held political positions in foreign policy and in national security. And this is exactly what Matt Gates was warning about. Sure, they made the sure they're going to make a an eight hundred million dollar cut from the budget, which is a, a a piss a piss in a bucket. It's a piss in the bucket to say we're going to get rid of eight hundred million when the when the provisions in the CR bill grant them the ability to spend unlimited amounts of money in the pursuit of military military industrial complex. When it comes to military, when it comes to Russia, when it comes to war, when it comes to defending our allies all across the world, when it comes to Israel, when it comes to Ukraine, hell, if a war breaks out there in Taiwan, when it comes to Taiwan, let it rip. Let the money flow. Let the money print. But we're going to get rid of $800 million of the discretionary spending. Piss in the bucket. Drop in the bucket. I told you before. A million dollars stacked up in a hundred dollar bills is as high as a, a, a standard table chair. A billion dollars stacked up in one hundred dollar bills is as tall as the tallest building on the planet. And a trillion dollars in one hundred dollar bills reaches the space station. Exponential math. They've bastardized your ability to understand exponential math so they can Ponzi scheme and steal your fucking money while they teach your sons how to cut their dicks off and become women. Scared all these, all all these, all these, uh, you know, rhino cut conservatives. Scared all of them into not wanting to talk about race, not being willing to talk about race. Let's just, let's just let it fade away. Let's let it die off. If you stop talking about it, then it, then it, you know, if you stop talking about it, it disappears. It goes away. It doesn't go away. You have to confront. You have to rebuke and refute. You have to rebuke and refute. You have to establish fundamental ideological first principles that you're going to live by, fight for, and if need be, die for. Something our opponents there in the Middle East of a different faith tradition, the Arabs, the Muslims, they seem to have that, they seem to have that at the center of their culture, writ large. And we're about to go into another conflict with them where we may get our asses kicked over the long haul because we don't have that type of commitment. Sacred honor, national honor. And yeah, yeah, you could fight a war. Maybe there is a war coming between Christians and Muslims. Maybe there is a war coming between the West and the Arab world, a, 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 a war or, or a fight of, uh, which, you know, of the likes of which we have not yet seen. Possible. Possible. Absolutely. More probable that the Western elites who are very, very highly trained and highly organized co-opt the momentum and the energy of the Arab and Muslim world to further bring the West into a, 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 a death spiral. More probable that that's the case and circle back and, and, and suppress the Muslims and formally re-educate the Muslims like Hillary Clinton said, us, us America first Donald Trump supporters need to be formally re-educated like they're doing there in China to the Uyghur Muslims. Are you seeing the connection yet? Are you seeing the similarities? All the while, we, we spend so much time bickering about shit, we really don't know anything about shit we've been told. We spend so much time doing it. The Nazi moment is right here before us, and it's very clear that economic imperialism, that economic Ponzi schemes, financial corruption is at the heart of the agenda, and most people aren't even awake to it. You don't even realize this is the official Nazi moment of modern America. And that's exactly what it is. When you're a House of Representatives, when the United States Congress is calling for a bipartisan path forward where they change the rules to strip the rights of the minority and they do it in the name of the Jews or they do it in the name of black people by putting black 
bourgeois sellout, Hakeem Jeffries up for the job. It's exactly what happened in Nazi Germany. Only when the Nazis did it, they didn't wear a bunch of colors. You know, when they were in the house, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't yell, Hakeem, Hakeem, Hakeem. Like they're at the high school fucking pep rally. Because even though, historically speaking, we could look at the Nazis as our enemies, ideologically, spiritually, politically, culturally, we can look at the Nazis as our enemies. We must respect the power. We must respect the competence. We must respect the skill and commitment of our enemies. In the last couple of weeks, Donald Trump said, hey, hey, Hezbollah and Hamas and some of these people, these people are smart. These people aren't idiots. They, they, these people have some, these people have some, you know, they have some, you know, they, they got something that, that they're willing to fight and die for. And when you have something you're willing to fight and die for, it, it increases your competence naturally. You're paying closer attention. You're planning more. You're spending more time. You're practicing more. You're, you're, everything is, is, is elevated. The stakes are raised. Donald Trump says that these people are smart. They're not idiots. And everybody says that he's, you know, he's making an excuse for Hamas or he's condoning Hamas or, or, or you know, saying something that's politically incorrect at the time. No, we're on our way into world war, and he's telling the American people exactly what they need to know. Here are our enemies. Here are their strengths. Here are their weaknesses. Here's what we need to be doing or thinking about going forward. And I'm here to tell you what we need to be thinking about first and foremost is all these American political, polite, polite, polished, posh, political puppets there in D.C. that you all fucking voted for, or many of you out there voted for, not everybody. If it doesn't apply, it doesn't apply. Don't be the one in the comments, oh, I didn't vote for them, or we didn't vote for them, the elections are stolen. No, I'm watching you. Yeah, don't get lost in your echo chamber. Go and venture out a little bit there on social media, and you'll find no shortage of people. Maybe they're people, maybe they're bots, but I've actually met these people who believe in a Kevin McCarthy, who believe in a Hakeem Jeffries, who believe in the Democrat platform, who believe in the Rhino platform, who believe we should send unlimited amounts of money to Israel, who believe we should fight in the Ukraine until every single territory is given back to the Ukrainians. There are people out there who believe that. And you need to get outside your echo chamber and understand that what you see there represented in the Congress and the will of the Congress is the result of those people's will, political will, cultural will. And we face a Nazi moment right here in America today. Come together, bipartisan, unify, uniparty. Find, create, solidify a path forward to do business as usual and strip the rights of the minority. And we're going to use a minority to do it. And here, I'll show you. Let me, let me show you the minority they want to use. Republican civil war so we can get back to doing the business of the American people. And we as House Democrats are committed to finding that bipartisan path forward. Stop in the a Republican civil way. war. Leader Jeffries, this civil has been war. going on for 11 days. Why haven't formal conversations started yet? At this point, that is on my House Republican colleagues. We have made clear publicly and privately that we are ready, willing, and able to enter into a bipartisan governing coalition that puts the American people first and solves problems for hardworking American taxpayers. My Republican colleagues have a simple choice. Yeah. They can either double or triple down on the chaos, dysfunction, and extremism, or let's have a real conversation about changing the rules of the House so it can work in the best interest of the American. What are your demands, Leader Jeffries? You talk about changing the rules in the House. Can you tick through a couple of your demands that you're going to ask for? Well, these aren't demands. Uh, we are ready to be reasonable uh, in trying to find the common ground necessary. What are they? To what is it that you want? That 
We want to ensure that votes are taken on bills that have substantial Democratic support and substantial Republican support so that mm. the extremists Uniform. aren't able to dictate the agenda. The current rules of the House have facilitated a handful of Republicans being able to determine what gets voted on in the House of Representatives, and that undermines the interests of the American people. We can change the rules to facilitate bipartisanship, and that should be the starting point of our conversation. That should be the starting point of our conversation. Change the rules. The current rules allow for an extreme minority, uh, 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 an extreme radical, Minority, MAGA, America First, Nationalist, Freedom Caucus, whatever you want to say, it allows for them to be able to stifle the business of the American people. It, it allows for them to be able to stifle business as, uniform, as usual. Let's come together as the uniparty and, and, and just make it impossible for these people to have any voice. I mean, Hakeem Jeffries, you are such a fucking sellout. Do you people understand who voted for this motherfucker? Who voted for this guy? Look at him. Look at his face. Does this look like a guy who is serious? Does this look like a guy who has real convictions and passions? Does he talk like a guy who has convictions and passions? Does he talk like a man who's going to lead you out of a world fucking war? He can barely handle a, a, a stern line of questioning from somebody from within his own camp, from within the wire. He got irritated by her pushing on him to give a definitive answer about what rules he wanted to change, partly because he doesn't want you to actually, he don't want to have to actually say that they're trying to change the rules of the Congress because it's Nazism. And how can a black man come before the American people how can a black man come before the American people on primetime television and make a pitch that they should change the rules of the Congress, Congress to strip the rights of the minority so that the two-party dichotomy, the two-party smoke and mirrors of the American political culture can really become the one-party American political culture formally? He wants to formally change the rules so we have a one-party rule. This is the most important, this is the most important, most dangerous, most offensive, most disgusting, despicable thing happening right now in our country today. And everybody should be covering it nonstop. And if you notice, there's barely a whisper. Yeah, Steve Bannon's going to cover it. Yeah, Alex Jones has been saying it for 25 fucking years and you let them call him crazy. Just like you let him call me crazy. Hey, please call me crazy. Name of the show. The crazy part is the mainstream media that we've continued to give our money to, we've continued to give our support. We see the ads on television. It translates into things and, and, and goods that we buy, services that we buy. We've paid into the machine. And everybody in this machine, everybody in this mainstream media industrial complex, for the most part, is completely okay with this, including Fox News. Cancel your cable television. Cancel your cable television. It's over. Just cancel it. Cancel it. If you're still watching Fox News out there, you're a fucking moron. I know you're controlled opposition, and I can hear it. I can hear when you parrot the party lines, the 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 controlled opposition party lines of the Mark Levins and the Ben Shapiro's and and everybody else over there who's in the right wing of the alternative media and and you know, it really ain't talking about shit. This is the only thing to talk about. Not all Matt Gates and you'll hear them. You'll hear all these Rhino cuck conservatives say over the next week as this story about the, the the speaker vote continues to to gain momentum. It'll make its way to the headlines, and I guarantee you the cuck conservative rhino narrative is going to make it seem like Matt Gates is the reason we're in this situation. I guarantee, mark my words, 
you will hear across Fox News, across mainstream, mainline conservative media, that none of this would have happened had Matt Gates and a, and a few radical Trump supporters in the House Republican uh, in the in the House Republicans went out of their way to get rid of Speaker McCarthy. In fact, they're gonna they'll even go so far as to make the claim that Matt Gates can't be trusted, and he may have been in on it with the Democrats the whole time to make this a possibility. Double cross, triple cross, quadruple cross. Oh, everything's up on the bar now. And any story will work, whatever the American people will accept. And I told you before, I know it's hard to believe. I know all these baked-in racial narratives that black America, and by, by way of minority uh, or, or the diversity, equity, and inclusion, historical oppression bunch. I know it's hard for you to believe that a Matt Gates is more interested in your prosperity and well-being than a Hakeem Jeffries based on their skin color, but I guarantee you the type of government you're going to now where they suppress the voice of the minority, where they suppress the ability for the minority to be involved in the democratic process, I guarantee you this will be more harmful to you. This will be more oppressive to you. This will be more suppressive toward you than what Matt Gates is trying to do. I guarantee fucking tea it. But no, 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 no. All you bourgeois black folks out there are just happy that another black man is at the center of American politics, that another black man is getting his chance to, to, to stick it to the man, to, to stick it to the white guy, by becoming the Speaker of the House, and they're all using them. You see who they put up there to introduce them. You see who they put up in, you see who they put up, who they put up as a, as a sort of a, a speaker to the rite of passage. The liberal white woman. I mean, did you guys hear her talk? I, I, honest to God, I have trouble believing that these people ran political campaigns in their respective congressional districts. And people actually believe that shit. I can just tell from the way they talk they're not genuine. And I think most of you should be able to as well. And then I start to ask myself, if you know, if you know that the person who's running for office is full of shit and you vote for them anyway, are you really voting for anything that they said? Or are you voting for them to be a purveyor of the status quo because you like the status quo? The referendums on the American people, I said it during my congressional campaign against Ilhan Omar. You know, I had Der Spiegel, you know, the, the, the German version of Washington of, of the Washington Post, the far leftist progressive uh, publication there in Germany. I had them come, you know, interview me at a big three game over this past summer. I had them come in, maybe it was last, no, it was last summer, I apologize, it was last summer. I had them come interview me last summer, and, you know, they, they asked the question, oh, well, what if you don't win? What if you don't win, then what are you going to do? And I told them then, which I kept my, my promise, I'm going to run for a bigger office. I'm not discouraged by defeat. This entire modern, mainstream, Corrupt status quo, political culture wants you to feel a sense of, of discouragement and defeat. You're going to lose some battles. That doesn't mean you lost the war. Okay, I lost the congressional race in a primary against a rhino establishment that put up a, a, a candidate who has the same, the same financial backers as Nikki Haley, the same exact financial backers as Nick, Nikki Haley, they put her up, ran her through, stole money from her campaign, raised millions of dollars. There wasn't a single fucking billboard in CD5 about Cicely fucking Davis. There wasn't a single billboard in CD5 when, the ele when it came time for the election because all of the, all of the third-party campaign consultants and fundraisers and grifters had siphoned every fucking dollar off of her campaign that they could, and they probably gave her a kickback so she could put money towards her, her phony weave uh, fund. And she did wear a phony weave. And people who wear a phony fucking weave should be automatically disqualified for running for United States Congress in the middle of a world fucking war. And they should also be disqualified for talking 
about politics in the middle of a world fucking war. That would include Joy Ann Reed. And I know you guys don't like the swear words. I know you, 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 you still think it's going to go back to normal. You still think there's time to solve this. You still think that there's a level of extreme that's just, you know, fear mongering and, 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 and fear porn. No, Hakeem Jeffries and the House Democrats are working right now, right now today, to come together in bipartisanship, which has become seen, seen as some, you know, we have such a uniparty culture. We have such a, a, a corrupt status quo culture and acceptance of a corrupt status quo. We all hear bipartisanship and think it's a good thing. No, if they come together bipartisanship and bipartisanship to preserve a corrupt status quo, it's a bad thing. It's a terrible thing. It's a dangerous thing. That's what we call the uniparty. And it's so powerful now. It's so, it's so, so damn close to executing the final agenda that Hakeem Jeffries can barely sit still in the interview and his own, and his own uh, self-promoting media platform. MSNBC, they're fans of Hakeem Jeffries. They love Hakeem Jeffries. Everybody from the corrupt status quo loves Hakeem Jeffries. They all love him. He can barely take a line of questioning from them because he's a fucking sellout. And he knows the more and more time that he spends up at the microphone, the more and more time he spends before the American people, his sellout, his sellout character, is going to become more visible. Don't ask me any more questions. We want to get the house back open so business can go on as usual. And of course, that's a net positive for the American people. They should trust us. They should trust all of us moderate, more center of the aisle politicians who are going to spend their money in perpetuity until the entire American, uh, the, until the entire American economy is in jeopardy of collapsing and their great-great-grandchildren won't have a pot to piss in. They should trust us. Why are you questioning me? Why, why, should I, why do I still have to be here? I should be getting the deal done with the House Republicans. I got House Republicans to call. I got McCarthy supporters that, that are now going to try and, and, and whip the vote. We're in a gridlock here, a rightful gridlock in the House. It's a good thing. And MAGA, the, the eight America firsters in the Congress, the eight America firsters that, that Matt Gates led in, 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 in contestation of this bill and, and eventually got rid of McCarthy, that was your doing, the war room posse. Those eight people are being, are being described as the extremists that are harming the American people when it's the exact opposite. And our infatuation, our love, our, our, our brainwashing about this idea of democracy being a, a net positive, regardless, regardless of the result, has led us to a place where many of the American people, just on face value, view the disruptors as being uh, an inconvenience, as being a bad guy, as being the villain in the situation. Why are you slowing things up? Why are you holding things up? Let's just get things moving. Convenience. And I've said on the podcast time and time again, convenience will be the death of freedom. Convenience will be the death of freedom. And here we are. Here we are. Everybody wants things to be more convenient. Everybody wants things to move along as usual. Everybody wants things to move along just in enough time for them to make it home on Sunday uh, uh, to watch, uh, you know, Sunday night football. Have a Budweiser, eat a fucking hot dog. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more irritated than I usually am. Why? I'm on a two-day water fast. I'm coming towards the end, uh, towards the, the close of my second day of a, of a three-day water fast. I'm sorry, three-day water fast. Yeah, not having any carbs, not having any food. Yeah, that's got me a little bit in a bad mood. 
but I can't say that it's the three-day water fast when I watch a fucking video where they put a black man up there who calls for a, a, a house a House of Representatives, a United States Congress to come together in bipartisan support to strip the rights of the minority in the democratic process. Yeah, I'm a little bit fucking pissed off. And I think you should be too. In fact, I know you should be pissed off. The question is, are you? And is it going to reflect, is your anger, is your frustration, is your, is your, 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 your is this betrayal going to reflect in the next elect, uh, you know, in the next election? You all should be calling these rhino conservative motherfuckers nonstop. You should be you should be blowing up their phones. Blowing up their phones. You should be calling their offices right now. You should be leaving voicemails today. They should get there tomorrow morning, Monday morning. They should get back to Washington. They should get to their office and have hundreds of missed phone calls blasting each and every one of them. For even, for even partaking in this scam. Hakeem Jeffries. A fucking Hakeem Jeffries. How does a motherfucker like this even get in a position where he's being put up for Speaker of the House? How is this even possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. All of y'all are following liberal white women. And they love putting a Hakeem Jeffries up as the solution to the problem. If he'll parrot the party line. If he won't ruffle any feathers, if he'll preserve the corrupt status quo, if he'll carry on with business as usual. They love a Hakeem Jeffries. They love him. You want to see her again? I'll show you. I'll show you what we're talking about. There she is. There she is right there. These people love a Hakeem Jeffries. This is who it's really about. It ain't about Hakeem Jeffries. It ain't about black people. This is who it's really about right here. For the majority to choose a bipartisan path forward to reopen the House, take yes for an answer. Every day, every day, the majority chooses to engage in a Republican civil war that is threatening to how she their talks. own members. I can barely stand it. Listen of to her. Engaging with us in the work of the American people is a day that weakens this institution and the standing of our country. We need a speaker who will govern through consensus, not conflict. We need a speaker worthy of wielding that gavel, a leader who will defend democracy, not degrade it. More than ever, Horrifying. we need proven, patriotic, people-first leadership. And that is why I am proud to nominate Hakeem Jeffries as Speaker of the House. Look at these people. Look at who we've elected. Look at who Democrats have elected. Look at the coalition of color here. You know, I mean, these people are, are horrifying. They're all old. They're all out of shape. You got the one white woman right there in the third row. She, she's, she's clapping so hard and dancing so hard. She's almost, she's almost left the fucking ground. Her feet are bouncing off the ground. She's so hyped up about this woke shit. And these, these are the people who you've elected. These are the people we've elected in this country to represent the will of the people. Motherfuckers can't even speak without reading from their notes, and you got a problem with me using profanity? They can't even speak without looking down at their fucking notes, and you got a problem with me using profanity. They're going to usher in a Nazi moment. They're going to usher in a, 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 a Nazi-type one-party rule right here under your nose because you were too fucking milk toast. You were too fucking lukewarm. You were too fucking, uh, uh, you know, weak in the stomach 
to take somebody telling you the way it fucking is. And you can blame and you you can use Christianity, you know, you can use God, you can use Christ, you can use religion as a cover for your apathy towards this corrupt uniparty. You can use whatever you want to use, and you know, you're using faith. That's what it really is. You're taking the Lord's name in vain. You're using Christianity and Christ and God as an excuse not to have to listen to the people who are really sounding the alarm on just how fucking pernicious these uniparty cucks really are. But then you want to go defend Israel in the name of the Bible. Oh, fuck you people. Fuck you people. I'm just going to be honest. It's bullshit. It's bullshit. Your Sean Hannity's of the world, your, your, your Mark Levin's, all of them. All of them. And some of you out there, too. Some of you out there don't got your shit in order. And we're going to talk about it. We're gonna, look, if we're going to go to world war, if this is going to be it, if this is the apocalypse, if this is Armageddon, ain't no, ain't no reason to hold no punches. Ain't no reason to tip, tip, you know, tiptoe and dance around the truth. If this is it, if this is the last dance, fuck you people. Fuck each and every one of you that sat there and, and bought into the, the, the bullshit convenient narrative that people like me and Alex Jones and Steve Bannon and Matt Gates and Donald Trump and, 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 and Larry Elder even or whoever else, that all these people were just causing an incon- were, were just were just inconveniencing us all. Well, let's see how inconvenient it is when the tactical nukes pop off. Let's see how inconvenient it is in nuclear holocaust. Let's see how inconvenient it is in a police state, a global police state, a global surveillance police state. Let's see how inconvenient it is when they come and round you up and formally re-educate you. When Hakeem Jeffries and the Clintons get up on the stage and lock arms in unity. Let's see how inconvenient my tone or my use of profanity is then. And see, I know some of you. I know some of you's mentality. I know, I know, I know your mentality. I know your 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 uh I I I know your your spirit. I can I can feel it. I can see it. I can watch you. I can hear you. I can I can see what you say and understand your psychology. You just don't think it's real yet. You just don't think it's 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 true yet. You just can't bring yourself to believe it. What else do you need to see? I mean, how can you in one breath complain that the state has become tyrannical when it comes to vaccines or, or elections or, or lockdowns or, or mask mandates or LGBTQism in the schools or, or whatever else? How can, you, how can you make the claim that the state has become tyrannical in all these ways, but yet you don't see a, a, a need for, for, for um, urgency? Where's the sense of urgency? Where are the anti-war protesters? Where are the anti-nuclear war protesters in the conservative movement? Where are the anti-war protesters in the liberal movement? Why are people not in the streets? It's only fall. It's not even cold out yet. Where are all you people? Sitting in your fucking house waiting for them to come knock on your door, and you want to hope that they're not going to knock on your door. And they may not knock on your door because in all actuality, we can create a prison where you already are. The technology is going to be so advanced. The level of surveillance is going to be so advanced. The, the power and might of the military is going to be so advanced. We don't have to bring you to, an, to an off, uh, uh, another location. We don't have to bring you off-site to, to a FEMA camp to imprison you. You can't even get past the prejudgments of your own ideological uh, worldview to see that you're about to be enslaved and imprisoned. So I guess you're nothing, you're, you're, you're about as good as a, a prisoner right there in your own home. We're gonna make it harder for you to move around by inflating gas prices, which a war in the Middle East is sure to do. We can make it hard for you to move. We can, most of you are fat as fuck. Let's just be honest, you don't like to hear it. Most of you are fat as fuck. Most of you are fat as hell. You're not going to get up and walk anywhere. You're not going to get up and bike anywhere. You, you don't got no horse out back. You're not going to get up and go ride your horse. You ain't got a fucking a bike, a, a pair of rollerblades, a skateboard, a 
nothing. You don't got a good pair of walking shoes. You're fat as fuck. And I, I don't, it's not a, look, I'm not making it up. Just look at the American statistics on obesity. Fat than a motherfucker. Fat. They raised the price of oil so you can't afford to put gas in your car. You ain't going nowhere. They don't got to bring you to a FEMA camp. The FEMA camps are going to be for the Royce Whites of the world. The FEMA camps are going to be for the hitters who realize the move that's being made and say, "Uh uh-uh, we're not going for it. We're the ones who are going to be lined up on the wall and shot in the back of the head or or carted off to the FEMA camp. That's going to be us. Where are you going to be? Who are you? Which person are you? You better be out there running. You better be out there preparing. You better be out there prepping because we're in it now. World War III is upon us. The apocalypse Armageddon is upon us. I'm not fear-mongering. It's just what it is. And the saddest part about it is you all had the chance to change it. We all had the chance to change it. We all had the chance to say, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm not going to let some some uh, middle-aged boomer political grifter stand up at the podium, on the stage, under the spotlight, and tell me everything I want to hear in some polite, polished, puppet-like manner and buy it and go for it. You all had the chance. You all had the opportunity. And if we're too stupid to see these people for who, who they really are, maybe we deserve to be enslaved. Maybe we deserve to die. Maybe we need to stop talking about morals and ethics and justice and, and all these uh, peace and all these other ideas and just face the facts that if you're too dumb, if you're too weak, if you're too, if you're too brainwashed to see when the establishment is going to try and take your freedoms outright, then you deserve to be a slave. I'm not going to go. And I would hope that a fair portion of you out there would resist as well. Resist these people. Resist Hakeem Jeffries. Resist this call for bipartisan, uh, a bipartisan pathway forward. Resist these people. These people mean to create a formal one-party rule here in America where business as usual, where the corrupt status quo cannot be disrupted by a minority. Who do you think the minority is? Yeah, right now it's Matt Gates and other radical or extremist Republicans, quote unquote. Right now they're seen as the minority, but pretty soon the minority could just as easily be you. The minority of people that live in your area code, the minority of people that live on your block, the minority of people that, that, that have your height or your weight, the minority of people, I mean, the minority, we talked about it the other day, the divisions are infinite. We could start dividing and rounding people up and calling them minorities into infinity. And they will do it. And that's exactly what tyrants do. That's exactly what the Nazis did. That's exactly what Mao did. Communism or fascism. All I see is secularism and globalism. And authoritarianism. That's what I see. I can't even believe these people. I don't even know how these people got elected. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't even know how these people got elected. I look at I look at all these people and see complete fucking goofballs. I mean, just goofy. Completely and utterly goofy. And these are the people running the country. And here I am running for a Senate seat, and you'll have people in Minnesota, for example, oh, Republicans in Minnesota love Amy Klobuchar. We had people inside the Republican Party say it would be a shame if somebody beat Amy Klobuchar because she's so good for Minnesota. Fruitcakes! Rhino, cuck, conservative, fruitcakes! That can't wait to, to, to bend the knee at the altar of the Amy Klobuchar's of the world. Yeah, they're inside the wire. They're here in the Republican Party. If you're in Minnesota, you better be getting ready to, you better be getting ready for February in, in, in time in, to, to come out for the caucus. 
I don't know when your caucus is in your respective state. Whenever your caucus is in your respective state, you better be putting all your focus and energy into rallying as many America first as as many American citizens who believe in this country and having a country, getting them together and getting ready for caucus. So you can become a delegate for America first candidates. PrecinctStrategy.com. If you need to find out more about how to do that, go to PrecinctStrategy.com. Sign up. Become a delegate. Become a Republican Party officer. Join the party. If you're not going to join the party, you go in on the day of caucuses and you vote for the country. You better be getting ready. You better be getting ready for caucuses. Here in Minnesota, I don't even know who they're going to run against me in the Republican primary for Senate. There ain't been a notable name that pops up yet, but I guarantee you one will. I guarantee you one will. In the weeks and months to come, I guarantee you, instead of the Republicans who have, who have made it very clear on a statewide basis, they need to find a way to get more, more minorities involved, more votes in deep blue districts in the highly dense metropolitan areas such as Minneapolis and St. Paul. Statewide, that's the agenda. That's the goal. And here is myself, a candidate that came from the Twin Cities, all around the Twin Cities. A minority myself, quote unquote, and watch how fast the Republican establishment in this state, in the state of Minnesota, marshals their resources to run somebody against me. You watch. Or they could concede now. They could concede right now. You watch how fast. My money is they put somebody up there against me. Because they like Amy Klobuchar. They don't want Amy Klobuchar to have to face any harsh questions. They don't want Amy Klobuchar to have to face any real scrutiny. Amy Klobuchar is as middle of the row as it gets. And all you have to do to find out who Amy Klobuchar is, is go back and watch and listen to her tweets over the last few weeks about the House business, about the business of the Senate, about the war there in, in, in Ukraine, and now the war there in Israel. She's all on board. More money for the military. More money, more money, more money. More money, Klobuchar. More money, Amy. Looks a lot like the white woman that stood up and and sponsored Hakeem Jeffries as House Speaker. Show Show me a speech where Amy Klobuchar isn't looking at her fucking notes. I come here three, four times a week for an hour and a half. I don't got a piece of paper in the entire fucking room, let alone be reading from one. I feel uncomfortable even loading up videos because it feels pre-baked. But I had to show you Hakeem Jeffries' face, the MSNBC softball interview that he couldn't barely stand, and the people there in the well of the Congress that stood up like seals and clapped for a one-party rule. America's Nazi moment. We're living, we're living through it right now. And how did the Nazis come to power? They were the working class that unionized, that became the bourgeoisie, that took political power and then solidified political power through an authoritarian police state. It's all out lawfare. It's all out weaponized judiciary all across the country. It started with Alex Jones. It started with Steve Bannon. It's moved and migrated to Donald Trump. If you think that you support Donald Trump or you're America first and you can't take a little profanity, take your fruitcake ass across the aisle and go caucus with the fucking Democrats. I'm sick of you people. I'd rather die and lose alone than stand next to motherfuckers who are as fake, lukewarm, milk toast as the very people that mean to enslave me and and mean to take my rights. Go caucus with polished, polite puppet Hakeem Jeffries. Go caucus with the Democrats. Because chances are, uh, unironically, chances are, if you got a problem with profanity, 
If you're one of these milk toast, lukewarm Republicans, you probably hold, you probably hold uh, simultaneous worldviews that keep new people from coming in the party. In fact, that is the case. That's what we've seen to be the case. Not only are you a conservative who's, who's, who's soft around the edges, can't take a little bit of profanity in the middle of a world fucking war, not only are you that way, but then you want to be the and George Floyd, George Floyd was on fentanyl. Look at all the raging, uh, the, the roaming, ra- ravaging black men that are stealing money, stealing, uh, you know, uh, designer bags out of department stores and whatever else. That's the real fear porn. The real fear porn isn't the isn't the 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 uprising, isn't the 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 takeover of a uniparty and in, in becoming an authoritarian and tyrannical government. That's not the fear porn. That's a reality. The fear porn is you need more police in your fucking neighborhood to protect you from black criminals. Go fuck yourself. Go get it. This is how I know you're fat and you don't have you don't have a a, a fucking clue about what it means to be a citizen with freedom and rights. You don't respect it. You don't honor it. You're not committed to it. You don't really believe in it. It's just politics with french fries. It's just something to talk about. It's an ideology to try and hold on to, but you don't really believe in it. Because I don't care if a cop is black, white, yellow, or green. There is no part of my, 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 my thought process that believes a police officer is going to come save me from becoming a victim to criminals, to violence, to unlawfulness, to mental illness, to to whatever the case, to, to radical Islam. There's not a fiber in my body that believes police will make it there in time to save me from becoming a victim. And so I train every night in the garage. And so I'm doing my push-ups and my sit-ups. So I'm, I'm going and shooting at the range multiple times a week, practicing. Do you have a security plan in your house? Have you, have you been able to take the time away from your fucking tea and crumpets to create a security plan for you and your loved ones in the house? Children in the house? Instead of complaining about it, let's get prepared. Let's do something about it. Let's get serious about it. If it's really as serious as Fox News wants you to think, then we should be doing something about it. Watching them ain't going to fucking help you. Watching them talk about it every night ain't going to do shit for you. I can guarantee you that. And waiting on the police to get there ain't going to do shit for you. You have to do something for you. It's not what your country can do for you. It's what you can do for your country, right? Well, part of your country being strong now, part of your country being rebuilt in an image of something worth saving is you as an individual becoming a valuable asset to your country. By becoming a valuable asset to your state, by becoming a valuable asset to your city, your respective congressional district, and your immediate community. That's how you can help strengthen the nation. Not by watching Fox News hit you with the the, the race-driven fear porn. Because guess what? I don't care what Fox News says. I don't care what Fox News says. They've let Hakeem Jeffries and the rest of the black community all across the country be used to hijack the United States Congress, to hijack the House of Representatives on the basis of identity politics. Oh, the Republicans let this happen. The Republicans let this happen. This ain't happenstance. This this isn't a coincidence. The Republicans let the Republicans knew this was going to happen. The Republicans knew that the identity of black people would eventually be used to to screw down the final nails of tyranny, of tyranny and authoritarianism, one party rule in this country. They knew it was going to happen. They helped move it along. Now, whether it was out of now whether it was out of pure uh, 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 arrogance or, or ignorance or stupidity or, or whatever the case may be, or if they were actually in on the deal, if it was malice and corruption and manipulation, I don't know. 
I'm not going to go one by one and take an accounting of everybody's interpersonal dialogue. I, I don't know what the fuck people were thinking in their head, but I know it was very clear for many, many decades that the key to this country's path forward, that the, 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 the engine of this country's path forward, at least from the, the liberal uh, establishment's uh, point of view, was identity politics. And look where we are now. The border is wide the fuck open. And they're going to put a Hakeem Jeffries minority speaker up as a minority representative for Speaker of the House to do the business, the, 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 the corrupt status quo, business as usual, of the House. And we're going to go to war on behalf of the Jews, another minority. Minority, minority, minority. And half of y'all can't even bring yourself to say minority because the, the Sean Hannity's of the world and the rest of the cuck conservatives have got you over in your corner of the room scared than a motherfucker tweeting and Facebook posting about race. Oh, and there's the occasional, uh, you know, there's the occasional cuck conservative that gets a little brave and pops off an N-word. I'm seeing you two on the internet. Don't think I don't see it. There's a few of you out there that got a little brave enough to pop an N-word off. Out there, and out there, you know, wherever you, wherever you are, getting caught on camera, showing your fucking ass. Oh, yeah, you don't like it now. When it was the other day when I was talking about Jada Pinkett and the black bourgeoisie, everybody had claps and, 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 and attaboys. You don't like it now. And that tells you something about how this country went into the death spiral it's in now, doesn't it? Yeah, I see a few of y'all out there popping that N-word off. You know, it'll be the same people talking, Second Amendment, same people, you know, libertarian, you know, same people talking about Obama and the Muslims are coming, taking over and all that other bullshit. What are you scared of Muslims for? What are you scared of Muslims for if you have faith in God? If your faith is strong, if you live in a strong faith community? Why are you afraid of Muslims? Is it because is it because they 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 appear to be more committed than you? Is it because they seem to be having more children than you? Is it because they pray more than you do? Is it because when their nation states and their nation states leaders come to power on the platform of Muslim faith and they don't uphold that faith, they actually revolt and topple their government? Is that why you're afraid of Muslims? Or do you want to tell me it's because of what the Quran or the Hadith says? Well, one is a, is a, was a prerequisite or a predicate to the other. Whoever your opponent is out there, like our mainstream media said about Donald Trump, whoever your opponent or your enemy is out there, you better damn well know what their, what their strengths and what their weaknesses are. Or else you're not really even in the game. You're an NPC. You're a non-playable character. You're somebody that the establishment, that the gamers, that the, the puppet masters can push on and get whatever reaction they want. And the reaction right now is for you to, to, to cower in your fucking corner and, and be scared of blacks and Muslims. But let's go fight a war for Israel, an unlimited war for Israel. Of which, in the long run, we can't win. We know we can't win the war. We cannot win the war there in Israel. It's a reality that's unfortunate that we're all going to have to come to grips with. And we can walk down this path if, if, if we want to. And, it, you know, I, I, somebody feel free to disagree with me if you want to. Tell me how, if all the surrounding Muslim countries come together in some cultural narrative that allows them to put, a, put aside their tribal differences, their own tribal differences within the Muslim and Arab world, if they all rise up together and revolt against the West and their first stop is the doorstep of Israel, who's going to protect the Jews then? And all of you can say that Israel can protect themselves, but obviously they can't. 
if Israel really could protect themselves, if they were if they were strong enough to protect themselves, we wouldn't all be arming up ready to go to war for them, would we? Because I guarantee you, I guarantee fucking T you. If Mexico decided to invade Texas, America, which in some ways you could say is happening right now, Israel ain't sending no troops over to help us. The UK ain't sending no troops over to help us. Germany ain't sending no troops over to help us. The NATO alliance ain't sending no troops over to help us if we get invaded. As they shouldn't. We don't need your fucking help. We don't need you to come over here and help us. We got us. But somewhere in here, you know, this shit has gotten all mixed up. And for you to allow this rhino mainstream political culture and establishment to tell you that we're going to fight a war in Israel for the Jews based on the Bible, based on their biblical claim to the land, based on the, the, the preservation of life or the fairness or democracy of a people that can determine their own future, for, for you to let this establishment tell you that is an indictment of you. If you really think that we're going to war in Israel for anything other than our, our regional, strategic, national, and globalist interests, you, you're, you're, you're delusional. And if you get the right person in front of the right camera, in front of the right microphone at the right time of day, they'll come right out and tell you that that's what it's about. And you still won't listen, some of you. And again, when I talk about these things in general terms, I'm not talking to everybody. If you find yourself getting offended when I say something and go, that's not me, look in the mirror. Let's, you know, really check if it is you or not. If it ain't you, it don't apply to you. If it is you, I'm talking directly to you. If you actually believe that these people are going to arm up for a world war in Israel on behalf of the Jews out of fairness and justice and, and, and the preservation of life, you have got to be one of the most naive, ignorant, stupid motherfuckers walking the planet. And there's a bunch of them. There's droves of them. Tell me how a culture that doesn't believe in the preservation of life in any other facet of society is quick to run headfirst into a world war about the preservation of life in a single country. Tell me. Somebody, feel free to drop it in the comments. Where's the logic in it? Where, where, where is the logic? It's not an anti-Israel. I said the other day, Israel's a legitimate nation. Why? They fought a war for it. They fought a war on three fronts. They battled their, their, their neighboring enemies back into a surrender. They took the land. It's theirs. Along the way, the Palestinians have continued to fight and resist the resistance they think is rightfully, the land they think is rightfully theirs. And the thing continues on. Okay. It's got nothing to do with us, really. And it really, really pisses me off. When people try and use black skin or, or, or white European colonial history or, in, in some extreme cases, biblical references to justify us going to war on either side. For either side. I don't care if you... I saw some black folks the other day talking about, oh, we should feel aligned with people who are oppressed all around the world because, you know, we know nobody's been more oppressed than us. Black people in this country are oppressing themselves. Unpopular opinion. Unpopular opinion. Unpopular take. You voted for the neoliberal, neocon world order. You let Democrats stand up there on the platform and say that they are, are doing everything in the interest of your well-being and prosperity, your rights and freedoms. You allowed the Kamala Harris's to become the vice presidents of the world on the back of a black identity. You allowed the Joe Bidens to become the presidents of the world when they were instrumental in incarcerating black people in the 1990s and then come back around 30 years later just in time to procure the black vote to become president of the most powerful country in the fucking world. You voted for that motherfucker. You let Barack Obama stand up there and act like he was a black man, act like he was going to do this for the black folks and for multiculturalism all across the country. 
You voted for that motherfucker. And it's not just Democrats. Oh, oh, there was there was there was bipartisan support for Barack Obama, wasn't there? Bipartisan support. He was polished. He was so well spoken and articulate. He didn't use any cuss words. He didn't have any baggage in his in his in his past, or so we thought at the time. Turns out he might have been, you know, having sex with men at at at, at red roof ends. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Not really my business. But y'all voted for that motherfucker, and you continue to defend him. Black people continue to defend Barack Obama. You let Barack Obama run as an anti-war president who will now come to the podium on the stage under the spotlight in defense of both people and talk about peace, but he bombed more brown and black people in Africa and the Middle East than all of his white predecessors combined. You let him use the black identity as a, as a, as a license to bomb and kill. And now you're all pro-Palestine. Yeah, yeah, like, 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 like this is the first time Palestine's been bombed or airstriked. Like this is the first time drones and superior military technology has been used in the region against people who are quote unquote defenseless. Go look at the record. Go look at the stats from the Iraq war. Go look at the stats from the Afghanistan war. How many people did we kill in Iraq? How many of them were children? And the dangerous part about this whole history is that because both both sides of the aisle are so firmly positioned on their side of the aisle, they have trouble coming to grips with and speaking to the truth that is actually there for them to use to foster a better future. To minister to the people, to minister to American citizens what they really need to hear in order to get a clarity around what's going on in the world today, in our country today, in our political elite class today. We can't even bring ourselves to get to, to, get to that conversation because there's all these trip wires. There's all these trip wires that push you back into your, your side of the political aisle, like the Iraq war, for example. We all know it was corrupt. We all know the Iraq war was corrupt. We all know weapons of mass destruction were a lie. And old George Bush went right on there in public the other day and said, yeah, Israel has a right to defend itself, like everybody says, like, like that even really needs to be said, right? Every living human being has the right to defend themselves. The, the question is, where is the line where defense stops and offense begins? And it's, it's not an easy line to draw. I'll say that in either direction. The Palestinians can say they're defending themselves. Well, when you suicide bomb somebody, is that defense or offense? I don't know. As a sportsman, I can say with, with, with some experience, the line where offense becomes defense and defense becomes offense is blurry. It is a thin line. It is a gray area. Some people will say the best defense is a good offense. Some people will say the best offense is a good defense. When you play really good defense, it leads to easy offense. When you play really good offense, it leads to easy defense. If I shoot a three and I shoot a high percentage and the, the other team has to take the ball out and I get time to get back and get set up on defense, I'm probably going to have a better chance of guarding a team successfully over the course of a game. If my defense is so good that I deflect a lot of balls or I, or I get a lot of steals, it leads to transition points, which often leads to layups or wide open jump shots, I'm going to shoot a higher percentage. Yeah, these are hard things to define. But one thing that isn't hard to define is that George Bush coming out saying Israel has the right to defend itself is some sign of moral clarity. Motherfucker, how do you even have the audacity to talk about foreign affairs or matters of military after the, the shitstorm that you caused in Iraq? How on earth does George Bush even feel uh, uh, comfortable speaking publicly after what went down in Iraq? Another indictment of we the people. Sure, George Bush had money, probably, you know, him and, and, and Rumsfeld and, and the whole, you know, the whole apparatus got rich off of the two wars, fine. I'm not talking about going and, and taking their money and, and, you know, seizing their assets or whatever the case may be. That's a decision for somebody else. I'm in the middle of a world war as a, as a person running for Senate in the United States of America right now today. I don't want to go back to 2004 and start adjudicating and bringing justice on, on war criminals from back then. I don't got the fucking time. He's got his money. He's going to be rich. He's comfortable, whatever. You know, 
The Bushes got juice. Okay, fine. Retire to Martha's Vineyard with, with, with your buddy Barack, and you guys have a fucking blast. Circle jerk, you know. Circle jerk, eyes wide shut, uh, swinger party, whatever you want to do, fine. But how on earth is George Bush comfortable coming before the American people and having a conversation, having a comment on military, on military action in the Middle East of all places? I mean, it's almost, it's, it's, it's hard to stomach, guys, really. It's, it's actually hard to stomach. And the craziest part about it is you all, some of you out there, not you in the War Room Posse, not you in the War Room audience, hopefully, but some of you out there in the conservative movement on the right wing, quote unquote, of the American political spectrum, some of you out there actually think Steve Bannon is the problem. Some of you black folks think Steve Bannon is the problem. You're going to let them throw one of the most brilliant and important political minds of our generation in jail because he actually threatened the status quo. And tomorrow on Monday night, for Monday night's show, I'm going to talk about Tucker and this recent George Floyd story, George Floyd story, because I think there's a lot to be said for that. Like, we're going to go back and talk about George Floyd now. All of the all of the progress Donald Trump has made with black voters and Latino voters and minority voters, all the momentum swinging in the direction of Donald Trump and the MAGA America First movement. All of the all of the truth that the conservative movement has stood for. And we're going to take the biggest racial icon, rightfully, unrightfully, the biggest racial icon, and we're going to make that primetime news, Tucker. And I love Tucker to death. I, I mean, I want to say, I think Tucker's smart. I think Tucker's sharp. I like Tucker. I like the work he's doing. I can tell, just like the Jews and the Palestinians and the black bourgeoisie and the, the black voters, the single black moms, the Hakeem Jeffries, the, the, the NBA players who are proto-China and, and whoever else up and down, side to side of the spectrum, is being used. And at the highest level, if you can't find the smoking gun of conspiracy, we have to believe that that that, that manipulation is metaphysical. Satan has the power to send all, all boats in the direction of wickedness. And right now, Tucker, you, you know, we're going to go back and talk and, and say George Floyd was a scam. And I'm going to talk about it more tomorrow, but I, I'm just trying to show how a lot of people, a lot of people, have been have been roped in, have been co-opted in in some small or large way into the down, the death spiral. And we'll all tweet online like, you know, the end times are here as though we had no no control over it, as though we still have no control over it. We could stop this today. Donald Trump is up 10 points. He's probably up more points than that in the polls. They will have to cheat in order to steal this election from Donald Trump in 2024. When Donald Trump gets into office, he will have the opportunity, not a certainty, he will have the opportunity to right this ship. As far as our nation goes, as far as much geopolitics and foreign affairs goes, he will have a brief moment for four years to right this ship, to, to do in government what can solidify a pathway forward, a genuine pathway forward for the American people in this nation. But everybody's got to be on their fucking A game now. Everybody's got to be on their fucking A game. And being on your A game means the Mark Levins, uh, 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 what, what, what's the guy who, deb who debated uh, uh, Steve Bannon in the Monk debate? He's from Canada. Another conservative stalwart. Forgot what his name is. Um, um, I'm not even, I don't even know what his name is. But all these neocon rhino conservatives, they're going to try and make you believe Steve Bannon is the problem. They're going to make you believe the War Room Posse is the problem. They're going to make you believe that the MAGA Trump supporters are the problem. The DeCuctus, the Ron DeCuctus followers are going to say, oh, Donald Trump, you know, Donald Trump, uh, the vaccine was him and the lockdown was him and, and, the, and the this and the that, blah, 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 blah. As though a man can't, as though a man can't grow from his formerly held positions. Same people will try and say Royce is a BLM supporter. Royce was marching with BLM. I never marched with BLM. They marched with me. 
because I was smart enough to see, I was smart enough to understand that that moment in American history was going to be used, was going to be hijacked, was going to be manipulatively propped up as the justification to take our rights and freedoms. And here we are. When you see Hakeem Jeffries, you're looking at the result of the George Floyd narrative. You're looking at the result of, of a failure to come out into the streets as conservatives all across the country and rebuke and refute. That's all rebuke and refute. Rebuke and refute. It's not even that hard. It's not even that hard. I know it's easy to, it's easy to rebuke and refute LGBTQism. It's easy to rebuke and refute uh, young black men breaking into cars or, or shooting uh, innocent people. It's easy to rebuke, rebuke and refute, um, uh, uh, you know, whatever cultural uh, abortion. Oh, it's easy to rebuke and refute that. And I'm not saying they shouldn't be rebuked and refuted. But watch how some people who put so much emphasis on those three cultural wedge issues fail to talk about the dangers of the military industrial complex and the unit party who will talk about those three cultural wedge issues, abortion, black-on-black -black crime, LGBTQism. They'll talk about those issues with, with, with ferocity, with passion, with conviction. But when it comes to the military-industrial complex and forever wars, they'll get real lukewarm. This is the dividing line. Nobody in the America First movement is in agreement with, with the, 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 the pernicious uh, uh, LGBTQism, black on black crime culture, or or abortion culture in America. Nobody is is trying to uh, pacify that or justify that. All we're saying is, like Matt Gates said, there's a bigger problem here. The bigger problem is that the culture of the political DC elite, the 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 DC cartel, the culture is to spin us into collapse, and they're going to use the cultural wedge issue divides as the justification or pretext to do it. And I, I want to go back, and I, I, I'll say this to end, to, to, to segue into tomorrow's show. And again, this is your Sunday ad-free show. I showed you a few videos. I got my technology working well so I can show the videos and run the videos. So I think on, on um, Wednesday we're going to do reaction videos. I'm going to have a reaction episode, which will kind of double as news, right? News and reactions we'll do on Wednesday. But I want to say again to Tucker, respectfully, Tucker, tip of the spear, huge platform, will have a huge impact on the outcome uh, of, 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 of these next couple of years and, and really the, the, the final outcome of the nation will have a huge impact. And many people will have a disproportionate impact. Now, in today's, in today's world, in today's culture, people's People's impact will, will, will reach far beyond the local. I want to say to Tucker and all you out there about George Floyd to segue to tomorrow. Was George Floyd a great person? No. By many metrics, was George Floyd a very troubled and, and even, you could say, a bad person? Absolutely. Was George Floyd somebody who had been involved in criminal, criminal acts? Yes. Is George Floyd somebody who was on drugs? Yes. Is George Floyd somebody we should look to as the moniker or role model of what every man, woman, or child should strive to be in America? Is that, a, is that an example of the American dream or the American, the, the American citizen, the rugged individualist with sacred honor and national honor? Absolutely not. Did George Floyd deserve to be propped up as some cultural hero or icon? No. Am I a Roman citizen? Do you have the right to bind and beat a Roman citizen who has not yet seen trial? And I just know, I just know as soon as I see the comments where somebody says that a, 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 a choke or a knee to the neck that, that doesn't cut off the blood or the air or, or that that putting your knee on somebody's back could not result or, or have an impact on them dying. I just know you've never been in a fight. I just know when I see you talk about the Second Amendment or when I see you post a video with your firearms, if I was around you, I'd be just in as much danger of you shooting me by accident if some shit really went down because you've never really been involved in nothing dangerous. Because if you had, you wouldn't say stupid shit like that.
Stupid shit. Every time you encounter a police officer, anytime anybody in this country, be they black, white, Asian, or anything else, anytime you encounter a police officer, that police officer is not responsible for your pre existing medical condition or conditions, plural. They're not responsible for your, your, your pre existing medical conditions. If an officer comes to, you know, a, 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 um, a fender bender, and it has to make a police report and you die right there on the spot from a heart attack, a pre-existing heart attack, that's not on that police officer. It changes when that police officer makes the decision that physical force becomes necessary. Once they engage in physical force, the question now becomes how much physical force is necessary. If that incident, if that encounter should result in somebody who had physical force used against them, dying or being seriously injured, the question becomes how much of that unnecessary or necessary force led to the outcome of that death or injury. Somewhat hard to measure in some cases. Some of it's hard to measure. Some of it's hard to measure. But I'll tell you this, Many of you live with a false sense of security about your own health and well-being. Many of you li live with false, with false ideas and false notions about your own health. The, the fragility of, of human life itself is, 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 has been propagandized into this, this false sense of, of, of uh, you know, uh, of security. If I'm sitting on a bus with an elderly man and an elderly man spits at my feet and then he dies uh, sitting there in the seat from a heart attack, am I responsible? Am I responsible for that? No. If the elderly man spits at my feet and I get up and I proceed to punch him in the face and he dies 10 minutes later or 20 minutes later, could I be seen as and held responsible for that? Potentially. Yeah, potentially. Because people who have pre-existing medical condition or a, a pre-existing pre -existing medical condition or have a certain health condition at the given moment, the stress on the human body, stress on the human body can certainly catalyze a failure of critical bodily functions and systems. And if you need further What's interesting about this is if you need further evidence, further confirmation that what I'm saying is true, I can bring Dr. Pierre Corey back on the podcast, which his first podcast episode we didn't get to put up because uh, technic uh, from, from a technical standpoint, we weren't running the podcast efficiently enough. So the audio and stuff got messed up, but I may want to run it anyway. But if just as soon bring Pierre Corey back, Pierre Corey was the first one who challenged the protocols in the hospitals uh, when it came to corticosteroids and ventilators and then was raked over the coals for promoting ivermectin and is still fighting on behalf of people to have the health, freedom, and choices they deserve as American citizens to make their own choices about their, their, their treatment, their early treatment, or even preventative treatment and care when it comes to COVID or any other virus or, or, or pandemic. That's Dr. Pierre Corey went before the Senate along with Ron Johnson, who, who, who invited him or who sponsored it, I believe, if I, if I recall correctly, to testify. And if you go to YouTube now, that Senate, that, that congressional, that D.C. testimony from Pierre Corey was taken down. What many of you don't know is that in the civil suit for George Floyd, Pierre Corey provided material expert evidence of how George Floyd experienced critical uh, bodily function and, and systematic failure on that day. Had Derek Chauvin simply sat George Floyd up against the car, handcuffed behind his back, obviously can't be a real harm or threat to anybody when you're handcuffed. I mean, you could run headfirst into somebody, I guess, or you could take off running, I guess. 
or you could do the move where you you know you 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 jump over your handcuffs and then you have your hands in front of you i guess but a simple taser usually it, it, it handles and solves that a couple of tasers from a couple officers will certainly solve that a couple thousand high voltage uh high volts through your body through your central nervous system certainly usually solves that unless you're some type of you know superhuman and they're out there there's some people who take the taser and keep coming I get it. Tough job for the cops. I get it. And for those people who take the taser, who are in the wrong, they take the taser and they keep coming. I am not, I am not condemning cops who then have to escalate to lethal force. But when a man is face down on the pavement, whether he's high on fentanyl or fucking crack, and it's one of the most despicable, disgraceful things you could do, is do crack cocaine as a black man is disgusting. But if that was the case, if he's face down, handcuffed, having urinated on himself and completely unresponsive, I think we can fair, it's fair to assume that, that that encounter could have potentially had some impact on the outcome of that day. And for all you cuck conservatives like Liz Collins, who's a never fucking Trumper to the max. All you cuck conservatives who want to make George Floyd the rally point, the, 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 the rally call of your political ideology, but you turn a blind eye when the military industrial complex is going to reach into your wallet, pull out all of your coins, and then take a piss on you before they ride off into a forever war. You, my friends, are the problem with the country. You, my friends, are exactly what gave the country away. Not condoning, condoning George Floyd's lifestyle. Not, con, not, not, not dismissing whatever he may have done on that day. Not saying we should look to him as some cultural icon or idol. In fact, I rejected that. That's why I went out and led the protest. This ain't about George Floyd, and it really ain't about Derek Chauvin. This is about the Federal Reserve and them using occurrences and instances like Derek Chauvin and George Floyd to create a cultural wedge and divide you people into fake political, fake political camps, fake political teams. And that's what they are. They're fake teams. Oh, I'm, Joe, I'm for George Floyd. I'm not. I'm for Derek Chauvin or I'm for, you know, black men or I'm for the police or whatever. They're fake teams. You're getting robbed. You're getting robbed. They're taking your money. They're taking every last coin that you or your children will ever have. This is a war on the working class. Working class black men, working class cops. And it's just that simple. It really is just that simple. You're getting played. And let me be the one to talk about a, a, an issue that's culturally, culturally, politically hypersensitive. To Tucker, wherever you are, I like you. Maybe my podcast is too small for you to even listen. But I was on your show. I remember when you were in the belly of the beast, in the rhino, never Trump or cuck conservative machine known as Fox News, better known as faux news. I remember when you were in the belly of the beast and I came on for three minutes and talked about the Federal Reserve and they never let you bring me back on. Or maybe you just didn't want to talk about the Federal Reserve anymore. I don't know. I like Tucker. I think Tucker's smart. I think you're sharp. But don't let them use you. Don't let them use you. Don't, don't let the Liz Collins hill be the hill you die on. If you got a heart murmur, if you, if you got a hole in your heart, or you got some type of pre-existing asthma condition, or, 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 or on that given day, you, you just happen to be having some, some, some allergic reaction, let's say. I don't know. And I decide to kick you in the chest, and that extra stress leads to a system failure in your, in your vital organs, I'm partially responsible for, for, for your injury or death. Now the question then becomes, in a sane and logical society, what is the rightful punishment for a man that had something to do with another man dying on that given day? That's what a sane and rational society would do. but. The left used Derek Chauvin as a scapegoat. 
They used him as a scapegoat to foster more racial division. And they knew that the, the Republicans, the conservatives, the, the back the blue, the back the troops, which half of these conservatives and rhino cuck conservatives do not support the troops. They do not back the blue because their policies, their, their, their worldview, their foreign policy, their domestic policy, their policy at the border does not foster safer, safer conditions, safer work conditions, better conditions, better training for our officers or our military. In fact, we want to hurl them into a forever war in the Middle East at unlimited support at all costs. And we do the same thing to our cops here. And that way, it's the greatest example of how our police here locally or, or nationally have become over-militarized. Yeah, they've become militarized in their training and tactics, but really they've become militarized in that the corporatocracy wants to hurl police at every single fucking problem that they manifest with their immorality and unethical behaviors and practices. That's how the police have been over-militarized. They're using the exact same way our military is used. To clean up shit storms that greedy, crony capitalist corporatists start. And when you go to fight a war, when you go to fight for something that's not really righteous, that's not genuine, that was never really honest to begin with, it, you're going to be more predisposed for PTSD because internally the human spirit is, is, has so much clarity, has so much intuition, has so much divine uh, uh, you know, touch from, from, from a metaphysical power, from the one true living God. Each and every one of you live with the, with the profound sense of truth. That when you go to fight a war for something that's not righteous and genuine, you're naturally going to start to question yourself. And we wonder why the veteran suicide rate is through the roof. Because we've put our veterans in a position to fight and, and even train those who didn't see active duty. We've put the entire military in the hands of corrupt, crony capitalists. And in some cases, corrupt, crony communists. And we wonder why they all have PTSD giving up time with their family, giving up time with their children and their wives and, and, and whatever, you know, and so on and so forth. Seeing their friends die, seeing their fellow troops die, seeing them blown to pieces, seeing them, you know, shot in the head or whatever the case may be. And we wonder why they're having problems. And we want to send them into another war again. Which one of you scumbag motherfuckers, which one of you fucking scumbags there in D.C. has the balls to stand up before the American people and tell us how you plan to go into another couple forever wars while simultaneously dealing with a suicide crisis in the veteran community, in the military? Tell us. I'm all ears. I'm waiting. And I'm going to talk more about Tucker and George Floyd tomorrow because I hate to see Tucker be used like that. I hate to see a Liz Collins be able to claw her way up to political prominence or, 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 or media significance and, and ride the coattails of Tucker as he, as he rightfully has, has pushed back against the mainstream establishment in one of the most historic ways of anybody in our modern time. I hate to see it. I hate to see it. It's bad strategy, and even more so, it's untrue. It's just not true. It's the wrong way to even look at things. What about the 75-year-old white guy who's posting what the, the security state or the Department of Justice deems as, as extreme domestic terrorism type of content on his Facebook, and they go to arrest him, and he has a heart attack, under the, and, and he resists arrest or tells them to go fuck themselves, and they taser him, or they, or they, or they kneel on him, and he has a heart attack in custody. I'm going to be out there in the streets protesting the overreach of the military and the security state and the Department of Justice and policing the same way I would with George Floyd. And if you have a problem with the way the left is hypocritical or contradictory or, 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 um, or selective in their outrage for police misconduct, that I can understand. That I can get behind. But I've just seen too many times when a white person has become the victim of police brutality or police misconduct or police negligence or all-out violence. I've seen when white people have become the victim of that crime and still there's a failure for the conservative movement to call any foul on the police. Why? 
because many of you live with the false sense of security that broadening the police state will, will, will make your life more convenient. And this is the dichotomy. This is, this is the two, this is the two party lie at the root of the, the culture, the American political culture here in this country. On the right, you got the convenience of, of security by making the government bigger through policing. On the left, you have the security of radical materialism by making the government bigger through social welfare. Radical materialism and security. Uniparty. Hakeem Jeffries. We got to do the people's business. The people want security and more radical materialism. The people want security and consumerism. The people want security and the ability to get high. And who are we? Who is Matt Gates to stand in the way of the will of the people? Well, the first thing we have to clarify, the first thing that we have to do is get our will in order. Clarify our will so we can fight back against this corrupt establishment and the agenda they set forth now. This is America's Nazi moment. The Uniparty is calling for an, a formal one-party rule. Yeah, we've lived under a Uniparty before, but never has, never has the Congress stood up in the well like they are right now while we're heading into a war and saying, let's change the rules to strip the minority of their ability to contest the actions, the legislation of the United States Congress. Never before has a man stood up unabashedly, unashamed, in the public, on primetime television and says, we need to change the rules so that the extreme minority cannot disrupt what it is we want to accomplish. That, my friends, is un-American. It's un-American. It's unpatriotic. It's dishonest. It's disingenuous. It's offensive. It offends me, and it should offend you. This has been another episode of Please Call Me Crazy, brought to you by Free People Radio. The fight continues. We appreciate your viewership and your listenership today and in the future. If you haven't already, drop a like, drop a comment, wherever you're watching, wherever you're listening. If you're listening, Remember to leave a review. I don't care if you say, fuck Royce White, he's lost his mind. Fine. Leave a review. Leave a comment. If you're in the live chat, whatever, wherever you are, make sure that you exit the live chat. Go to the actual content, the episode. Hit the like button. Repost if you like, if you, if you enjoy the content. If you agree with some of what I'm saying. Some of it may not be true. I'm not right all the time. But I'm certainly confident in, in a lot of what I'm saying to you. Because I don't have an agenda. Nobody's paying, nobody's paying my way. Nobody's bought my morality. Nobody's bought, turned me into a puppet or a mouthpiece. And that's why they're afraid that people like me will end up there in D.C. to back up Gates and the few others that are willing to stand up and say some shit that needs to be said. We appreciate your viewership and listenership today and in the future. The fight continues. Don't die a jerk off. Don't die a jerk off. If it's World War III, if it's going to be Armageddon, don't die a jerk off. You know? I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I'm not trying to d defame or, or berate anybody who has jerked off or who currently jerks off. What I'm saying is don't die a jerk off. The fight continues, and as always, Godspeed.